This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation, along with answers, are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit aamds.org slash learn. Welcome to our live webinar titled PNH, Clonal Expansion and Prognosis to MDS. Thank you for joining us. My name is Angie Onifre, Director of Patient Education at AMDSIF, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to acknowledge Salgin, Takeda, Achillean, and Genentech for providing educational grants to help support this webinar program. Today's presenter is Dr. Mashiavsky. Dr. Mashiavsky is a staff physician in the Cleveland Clinic Department of Hematologic Oncology and Blood Disorders and is board certified in hematology and internal medicine. He is also chairman of the Department of Translational Hematology and Oncology Research at the Telsic Cancer Institute and has an academic rank of professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Recognized for his scholarly achievement in biomedical research, Dr. Mashiavsky is an elected member of the American Society of Clinical Investigation. His clinical areas of expertise include bone marrow failure sy syndromes, including aplastic anemia, MDS, large granular lymphocyte leukemia, PNH, and myeloid malignancies. His research deals with the molecular pathogenesis of these disorders and deals with various specific aspects of stem biology, genetics, cytogenetics, immuno and immunobiology. Dr. Mashiavsky is also a member of our Medical Advisory Board. With that said, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mashiavsky. Well, uh, thank you very much for this uh, generous introduction, and I just wanted to confirm that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, so I just didn't want to, you know, to talk for for a long time and then realize that. So the audio is okay. Yes. Yep, you're good. Well, I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you about a topic that was given to me because apparently. Yeah, foundation having big outreach to patients, you know, solicit questions, and they are also aware of research that is being done currently in uh, uh, the diseases that we are covering, and this talk will deal with a relationship between PNH and myelosplastic syndrome, PNH being a non-malignant condition, and myelosplastic syndrome being, if you wish, a uh, um, a, a pre-leukemic condition that, uh, that, that is somehow different from aplastic anemia and PNH. So, but before I do that, you know, I am going to cover a lot of topics and some might be less related to it and more clinically oriented. And, but if you, at certain point, if the listeners feel that I am too theoretical and too off-topic, and too far from what they want to hear. I mean, I can I can make the curve back into into the mainstream. Um, so please, uh, you know, just let the organizers know. Um, there are several important questions that patients always ask, and I see it as uh, from the scientific point of view, as to how PNH, this fascinating disease, uh, produces. Uh, it evolves and and affects the patient. So one of the of the currently important topics is, of course, the fact that we all know that PNH is caused by PGA mutation in hemopoietic stem cell. However, the question is reasonable to ask whether there are other mutations that are involved in this disease other additional mutation, because what we learned from myelosplastic syndrome, that myelosplastic syndrome, another clonal disease, bone marrow failure, is driven by multiple, in, uh, by a combination of multiple in, uh, mutations. Now, the other important question is that some of us, some of the patients affected by having a PNH clone by laboratory testing, has this clone for a long period of time and never develops PNH, versus other patients develop slowly and surely manifest PNH because their clones expand. Uh, 
Finally, there are patients who present right away with PNH. So the question is, of course, what makes this tremendous clinical difference in the in the how the disease evolves. So, and I think one of the key issues in it would be to decipher what does PNH and PN and MDS have in common? What do they have in common and what are the major differences? Finally, of most clinical importance, and I am being asked this question a lot of by uh, anxious patients, is the question is, can my PNH and otherwise benign disease turn into myelosplastic syndrome, which of course some people consider a early stage of leukemia? So this is an important question, and I will try to address this question as well during my talk, which this is the main topic of our, of our presentation. Before I do that, I would like to I would like to talk a little bit about about terms that we are going to use. So I sort of put together a compendium, and so that we are at the same on the same uh, level in terms of in terms of understanding the the concept. So if we refer to hemopoietic stem cells, they are the most immature of the marrow cells. Essentially, if you were the mother cells of all blood cells, characterized by ability to form all blood cell types. That's why we know that PNH is a stem cell disease because all blood cells derived from the affected PNH stem cell are, uh, can be produced. Mutations are tiny changes in the genetic code of individual genes. And among them, we can distinguish germline mutations. Germline mutations are mutations that are present since our birth and are inherited from parents and they are present in all cells of our body. These are the ones that determine our general susceptibility to diseases, our features, the size, the, 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 the color of the hair, etc. Enzomatic mutations are mutations in specific cells, and thus the rest of the body is not affected, and the second most important feature of somatic mutations is that they are not inherited. In our case, we are talking about diseases of the bone marrow, and in the bone marrow, pig A mutation, the one gene mutation that causes PNH, is a somatic mutation, which means that PNH, the pig A mutation, is not inherited factor, and it's present only in a portion of cells. If we would take a biopsy of a muscle or we would take cells from the skin, they would not contain this mutation because they are, this mutation was acquired only specifically by hemopoietic stem cell. Now, very often patients, when you go to the doctor, he says, well, your clone size is this, your clone size is that. So what is a clone? Clone is formed out of daughter cells of one hemopoietic stem cells. We recognize that they are all derived from one mother cell by the fact that this mother cell is affected by a specific mutation, and this mutation is passed down to all the daughter cells derived from this particular stem cell. If you wish, such a mutation is a barcode distinguishing the clone from other stem cells and thus, if we can enumerate the number of cells affected by this mutation, we can refer as to clonal size. So there are several ways to measure the clonal size for PNH. We do it mostly by flow cytometry, but the most direct way would be to determine out of 100 cells in blood or 1,000 cells in blood, how many of blood cells are actually affected by the mutation. And this number tells you what is the usual clonal size? We express the clonal size usually in percent, and thus, if a patient has a very high PNH clonal burden or clonal size, then you know 80 or 90 percent of all blood cells are derived from the affected stem cells that carry the mutation, and correspondingly, all these cells carry the same mutation. 
So I think once we understand this concept, it's going to be for me much easier to uh, sort of advance. So once more, just to emphasize, we are going, they have different stem cells, and of course the very most immature and basic stem cell is fertilized, fertilized uh, egg, which essentially is an embryonic stem cell, and this stem cell gives rise to other stem cells' individual tissues in nerv uh, nervous system, in the brain, muscle, uh, in reproductive organs, but for us, most importance for today's talk is, of course, in blood. So we are going to deal, we are going to deal with blood stem cell and cells derived from this individual blood stem cells. Now, which brings me to, of course, the question: What causes PNH? So, just to emphasize that the stem cell and gene mutations are the two key. Uh, players within the mechanism of the disease. One of the hemopoietic stem cells, and there is a big debate how many hemopoietic cells that humans have, whether it's 1,000 or 2,000, or out of this stem cell, how many function at any given time. But without solving even this question, we know that in PNH, one of, of our stem cells was affected by a gene mutation, by a zomatic mutation, so again, not inherited. Other cells of the body don't have it in a gene which is called PGA gene. And the subsequent mechanism of the disease are related to this very genetic defect that is passed to the progenitor cells, and because stem cells can produce all the blood cell types, including platelets, including red cells, and including white cells, the immune cells, then all these cell types will carry PGA mutation. So PGA mutation lead to a defect in, in proteins on the surface of the affected cells, which causes then complement, uh, which prevents complement lysis, and this defect prevents these proteins to be on the cells, so the cells, if you wish, red cells or other cells are unprotected and therefore are destroyed by our complement. Now, based on this basing, uh, mechanism, we can explain many of the symptoms, including the thrombosis, hemolysis, and other symptoms in PNH. So, many patients will be interested, and you know, a part of, 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 of giving you a, a little bit scholarly view of the disease, I want to uh, sort of address some of the some of the concepts that come up when you see your doctor. Uh, is, of course, the clonal size. So in PNH, for years, clonal size is, has been measured by flow cytometry. And at the beginning of the disease, of course, the clone size is very small. And then as the disease starts to progress, the clone size expands. Anything somehow in the range of 20% will change our view as to a patient being just a carrier of a PNH clone to a concept that the patient actually develop manifest disease. And anything above 50% is clearly a PNH, not precluding that there is a great variability as to patients suffer in terms of the degree of anemia and the symptoms that they have, even if they have very large clones. So please do not get preoccupied. Oh, my clone increased from 65 to to 68%. Anything above 50 is a big loan, and there is clinically very little difference. In other words, somebody who might have clone of 30% might have a lot of symptoms, and somebody with a clone of 80% might not have much symptoms. Now, your doctor will tell you your, your white cell clone is this many percent, and your red cell clone is this many percent. Why they are not identical? Well, because white cells are being produced out of PNH, stem cell, and are not being destroyed for reasons that are not entirely clear. So they repro represent the clonal size. Red cells, in contrast to it, are being destroyed. So even if the patient produces 60% of the clone site is 
you expect in blood of this patient only very few red cells because most of them are being destroyed by complement, right? And I wanted to emphasize this in this in this slide. So this would be a patient who has white cell clone of 60%, and you would say, hey, if there were no hemolysis, this white cell clone would would equal the red cell PNH number in peripheral blood, proportion of PNH cells. So we have so-called gradient between white cells, and this reflects how much destruction bet uh, occurs between the white cells and the red cells. So now, if we give to a patient, for example, a culizumab and block complement, then red cells will not be destroyed. And here I indicated this patient had very few red cells because they are all destroyed, and these are the white cells alone. And after a culizumab was given, these red cells that normally being destroyed are being protected, and this gradient decreases. Thus, of course, uh, by this differential, number, we can express how much hemolysis is ongoing. Now, the other issue is, of course, if hemoglobin is being produced by these cells, now reticulocytes, the young red cells, the baby red cells, indicate how the bone marrow of a patient is reacting to the destruction of red, uh, to the destruction of red cells. So the second parameter a part of size of PNH clone is the number of reticulocytes. So if the patient produces a lot of reticulocytes, it means that his or her bone marrow tries to catch up with the loss of red cells, right, and tries, tries to make up for this gradient. If we give eculizumab to a patient who has high reticulocyte count, then the production will be not offset by the destruction and this gradient will disappear. However, it might be much slower in a patient who does not have high reticulocyte count. In order to restore the, hemo the right amount of hemoglobin in blood, uh, the production will catch up much slower because the reticulocytosis is less. So I just wanted to, to emphasize this very important concept that patients always ask the question, what does it mean to me? Now. I'm going to track back a little bit into the, the theory of PNH. So in the peripheral blood, in, in, uh, in bone marrow, the blood stem cell or hemopoietic stem cell produces all blood cell types, including lymphocytes, erythrocytes, granulocytes, monocytes, and platelets, okay? Now, if a PNH stem cell is present, so, in other words, this is uh, here, this drawing indicates among the healthy normal stem cells, there is a stem cell that, is, that has a defective PGA gene. The progeny here indicated as blue of this, of this stem cell will carry the defect. And the proportion between normal cells, here indicated in red, and these blue cells, is essentially what corresponds to the clonal size, right? And this is what is expressed in this. So we have a normal hemopoietic stem cell. When it div divided at certain point, it produced an abnormal stem cell with PGA mutation here indicated at this yellow dot. And this one can, of course, reproduce itself, so can produce other stem cells, right? Or it can differentiate and produce mature blood cells, as indicated here. So this portion, out of this affected stem cell, we would produce a PNH clone, and this would be the rest normal hemopoiesis, normal stem cells. Okay. So we have to track back in order to understand how PNH evolves to aplastic anemia. In, in aplastic anemia, there is a immune attack ongoing by our own immune system on our own hemopoietic stem cells, right? And this immune attack, if successful, destroyed hemopoietic stem cells. So these are the immune cells. They get synthesized by unspecified events. We don't know what it is. And once they go get, get proliferate and go after the normal stem cells, destroying them and producing the state of aplastic anemia. 
Now, however, PNH defect allows the PNH stem cell to escape this immune attack. If you wish, by acquiring this mutation, hemopoietic stem cells that are of PNH derivation who carry the defect are less susceptible to the attack by the immune cells. If you wish, they are better camouflaged. So the, our, so the patient's angry immune cells that normally would destroy normal stem cells actually don't see the PNH stem cells, and therefore, they preferentially uh, expand, as shown in this slide. So these are the normal stem cells. This is a first initially not very numerous PNH stem cell, but these immune cells, if you wish policemen, go after stem cells and destroy them, but they, for whatever reason, are blind towards PNH stem cells. And therefore, as a result of it, PNH stem cells enjoy a relative privilege and can thrive versus normal stem cells don't thrive. And this is what causes expansion of the PNH clone. Okay. Now, and this was important to state because obviously there is this big overlap between bone marrow failure syndrome, including myelosplastic syndrome, which is most numerous, most frequent, PNH, and aplastic anemia. Aplastic anemia, we believe, is maybe twice or three times as frequent as PNH. And of course, MDS, depending on the age group, but if we take 70 year old, is probably 20 to 30, if not 50 times more frequent than aplastic anemia, if we take people in the sixth or seventh decade of life. Now, aplastic anemia is a bone marrow failure. PNH and MDS are bone marrow failure syndrome with clonal outgrowth. It's just PNH is driven by PGA mutation. PNH clones versus myelosplastic, uh, myelosplastic clones are driven by other mutations. Okay? Now, we know that in many patients with aplastic anemia, and I think I have a slide to that end, we are going to address this, this, this issue. Um, in many patients with aplastic anemia, PNH clones are present, and some of these patients evolve versus in a high proportion, approximately up to 20% of patients with aplastic anemia, myelosplastic clones evolve. So the clonal evolution, whether to PNH or to myelosplastic syndrome, is a very common complication of aplastic anemia that has a time factor. And we approximately believe that 20% of patients with aplastic anemia would eventually develop PNH and maybe 20% might progress to myelosplastic syndrome. Okay. So, and as we were talking at the beginning about types of PNH that we see, we have, of course, this evolution out of aplastic anemia, and we call it secondary hemolytic PNH. These are those of you who have history of low counts, and nobody mentioned PNH to these patients. They were treated for aplastic anemia. I'm having aplastic anemia. And then at certain point, the counts got better, and then they usually get worse again, particularly hemoglobin, and they are being diagnosed with PNH. Well, they had the PNH from the very beginning, but it was a tiny clone. But during the course of the disease, this PNH clone expanded. Some patients, however, Strangely enough, when you ask them back and forth and you try really to get the answer, does, do not recall and don't have history of aplastic anemia. They're just being diagnosed right away out of blue with PNH. And we don't know whether in those patients aplastic anemia was very short and we just didn't notice it, or is it another type or a, another mechanism that causes the expansion of this PNH clone in these patients, right? And some, in some of the patients, there is a balance between aplastic anemia that is still ongoing and PNH, and we call them aplastic anemia PNH syndrome. So if you wish in, in hemolytic PNH, which where the clones are big, the production is less of a problem, and most problem is related due to destruction of red cells. In contrast, in Aplastic anemia and PNH syndrome, and in, aplastic, in PNH derived from aplastic anemia, there are various contributions of bone marrow failure, 
And these are the patients who have PNH, but they have low reticulocyte count. In other words, they have low intrinsic production. And of course, in addition to it, suffering from the destruction of red cells, they have a sort of, if you wish, a double whammer. Now, this is a plot showing, and sorry for the thin lines, uh, showing courses of patients where we measured the over, over here in this case, over a long period of time, behavior of PNH clone. It turns that probably up to 20 or 30 percent of patients, even more, tiny PNH clone of aplastic anemia patient exist. However, they, so in some of the patients already at presentation, we have anywhere from 10 to 15, 5 to to 20% of PNH cells, most of the patient would have a tiny PNH clone. And now, as you can see, in majority of patients, this tiny PNH clone persists, don't go away, they are just there, they sit there. But in some of these patients, and we would like to know why and who are the patients, PNH clone expand. Now, when we looked at parameters that predicted who is a carrier of a tiny PNH clone and progresses later on, there were very few clues. We know that if patient presents with a clone that is already somehow established anywhere between 5 and 20 percent, these patients have greater chance of faster evolution versus those patients who have just tiny PNH clones of 1 percent they might persist forever with this tiny PNH clone as indicated here. So these are the patients with higher clones and they expand, and these are the patients with lower clones and they never expand, okay? Now, we noticed when we measured what could predict whether they will respond. Uh, so of course the initial clonal size is predictive of non-expansion if they are tiny, but also patients who had ATG, they are less likely to have PNH expansion later on than those who were treated only with cyclosporin. So this is very interesting because it, it points towards severity or degree of therapeutic immunosuppression that these patients have. Now, this is once more shown that in aplastic anemia, there are patients who have, who have no, there are patients who have, uh, who have smaller clones, bigger clones, and, and who have higher Crohn's, and they are patients with PNH right away here. And of course, um, the, the distribution of PNH clone among moderate of severe aplastic anemia is relatively equal. Okay. But nevertheless, there is a large proportion of patients with pure aplastic anemia, around 40% of patients will never have a PNH clone. And we also don't know, it could be that these patients also have a PNH clone, but these clones are so tiny that we cannot detect them. Okay. Now, so this brings me to, of course, evolution of myelosplastic syndrome. So we were talking first that patient with aplastic anemia can evolve into, myel into PNH over a period of time. Not every patient who has tiny PNH clone will evolve to PNH. Some patient will. And while some PNH patients don't have the history of aplastic anemia just present as PNH, and we consider them slightly different. Now, by the same token, some of the patients with aplastic anemia evolve to myelosplastic syndrome. And, you know, we see here that over a period, and this you don't see the scale, this is approximately 20 years, some 20% 20 of patients over 20 years evolves to myelosplastic syndrome in PNH. This is important because myelosplastic syndrome is a pre-leukemic condition and usually have poor prognosis. So if this happens, unlike for PNH, evolution of myelosplastic syndrome is an indication to look more closely into the bone marrow transplantation as a curative option because these type of myelosplastic syndrome that evolve from aplastic anemia are usually difficult to treat. And this 
bone marrow biopsy slide indicates this type of transition. So if you wish, this was a patient who had aplastic anemia, and then over the time he developed myelosplastic syndrome, and this biopsy shows that here we have an aplastic bone marrow, and here we have myelosplastic bone marrow, and this, of course, will fill up the whole bone marrow space, and eventually myelosplastic syndrome will evolve. Now, I have to swing back now and tell you a little bit about deep sequencing. So in PNH, the ability, we could determine the size of the clone doing flow cytometry because we were measure the number of cells, of PNH cells. These are the cells who don't have certain markers, these GPI uncoat markers on their surface. But really, using new next generation sequencing, now it is possible to identify the actual mutation, so the quantitate and measure the number of mutant cells as supposed to measure the result of the mutation. Here, using sequencing, we can determine the, we can determine the proportion of cells in blood affect, affected by the mutation. Not only this, by sequencing, we can distinguish whether the patient has one PNH clone and multiple clones. And interestingly, what happened is that we have, uh, using this method, we identified multiple PNH clone in patients with, with, with PNH, multiple mutations. In other words, what to somebody appears like one hemopoietic stem cell got one defect in PGA gene and produce a PNH clone, what is, real, what real is happening is that multiple PNH hits, multiple PNH defect in PGA gene occur in multiple stem cells, and, and thus, you know, uh, a large proportion of patients with, with PNH harbors more than one mutation, two, three, four, and five. In fact, and I don't know whether I put a slide to that end. So here is, once more, this is a PGA mutation, this mutation in a particular place, this is a PNH clone, and the cells produced out of PNH clone. So this mutation, now we thought that there is only one PGA mutation. Now by sequencing, we know that there are multiple PGA mutation. In fact, the size of what we measured as a PNH clone are multiple clones that we cannot distinguish unless we do sequencing. And, and what happens is also that as long, and I don't have a slide to show you, but uh, that at the beginning of the disease, we have multiple tiny PNH clones. And then these clones compete with each other to that end that when the PNH evolves, one or two, we call it dominant or more uh, the strongest of these PNH clones that uh, sort of contend to be the leader in the disease in your blood wins. And so the, the bigger is the PNH clone, the more likely it is that there is one big dominant clone and the other smaller clone were uh, sort of pushed out. Okay. But as I mentioned, the PGA gene is a it's one gene and why there is so much variability in terms of in some patients, some patients progress, some don't, some patients have big PNH clones immediately, some patients take years to develop PNH clones, some patients never progress. So using this sequencing method that is very sensitive, we were able to determine that in some of the patients with PNH, the, the original PGA mutation is followed by another mutation. In fact, some patients have additional mutation. Now, one could envision that this additional mutation makes the PNH clone more fit, and therefore, it would expand faster, right? And so the presence of additional mutation indicates that, indicates that, that there is that they, they are uh, additional hits present that modify the behavior of this individual clone, right? Now, 
So this is indicated here what I told you before, and I'm going to summarize it just quickly. As you can see, these are, these are the normal cells and these are individual PNH clones. And eventually, as the time progresses, in this case, the red PNH clone, if you wish, outgrow the other clones, the green and blue, versus in the other patient, this clone one. But, and in fact, in some of the patients, the green clone here expanded, but tired out, and eventually the blue clone won after all, right? So this is how the disease, if you wish, progresses. And of course, this is reflected in different flavors of the disease. Some patients have severe disease, breast hemolysis. Some patients have indolent disease. I have patients who run, uh, who run marathon. I had a patient who was a very accomplished basketball player. And, you know, of course, after exhausting matches, had a lot of problems, sort of recovering, et cetera. But versus they are patients who are very affected and cannot do anything because they are so disabled by the disease. So additional mutation, which I described to you, in addition to the big A mutation, may also modify whether the PNH clone expands or not. And we call it intrinsic mechanism, right? So as here, this is a big A mutation, and big A mutation acquires another zomatic mutations, if you wish, and produces, if you wish, a mosaic clone that contains not only PGA mutation, but the other mutation that gives the clone additional gross advantage. And thus, if you classify all patients, you will find patients where PGA mutation is first, followed by another mutation. Here are examples that we found. They are patients who have another mutation followed by PNH, this patient is a sort of patient who might have myelosplastic syndrome. This is very rare, but within myelosplastic syndrome, PGA mutation evolved as a second hit. And then there are patients who have just PGA mutation or multiple PGA mutations. And finally, very rare patients in whom we have patients who have PNH and in addition, myelosplastic syndrome clone. Again, this and this are relatively uncommon. And thus, I always reassure the patient that they have already clonal disease with PNH, and the progression of PNH to myelosplastic syndrome for sure is more common than it would be in a healthy individual, but by, by itself is a very rare event. In fact, in, in most of the patients that I observe evolving to myelosplastic syndrome, with few exceptions, most of these patients were patients who did not have a PNH clone. So while the risk compared to healthy individual is much higher because these diseases are so intertwined and related to develop myelosplastic syndrome of pre-leukemia out of PNH, the overall risk is relatively low. Once somebody has PNH, this PNH will be predominant picture and the chances that this patient develops myelosplastic syndrome are relatively low. Hey. So if you wish, we have, you can classify the patient with, with BNH in those in whom the PGA mutations was first, in those and followed by other mutations, right? This is indicated as here, the green is PGA mutation. These are the normal cells, and the PGA mutation was followed by a mutation in a gene called TET2. This is just an example, versus in this, the TMC1 gene mutation was first, followed by PGA mutation. In this case, normal two different clones appeared uh, simultaneously, and this patient, if you wish, carries this, this mutation and PGA mutation together. Okay. So, in conclusion, PNH might have more complex structure, including additional mutations, such as those seen in myelosplastic syndrome, PNH evolves through slow dominance of a single PNH clone among initially oligoclonal, so single, uh, or initially oligoclonal disease, disease where multiple clones are smoldering, if you wish. The selection, immune selection, drives the expansion 
but the factors for the, this drive remained unclear. We uncover one of these factors, which are additional mutation, but what other factors drive the expansion is not clear. Clonal mutations are present in aplastic anemia, but unlike in PNH, where PGA mutation then persists or expands in typical aplastic anemia, other clonal mutation come and go and can be outgrown by normal cells. But in some cases, this clonal mutation eventually lead to evolution of, of myelosplastic syndrome. And if you wish, a transitional disease entity are those patients who have hypocellular myelosplastic syndrome, namely have feature of having several mutations, but having empty bone marrow. Okay. All right. I would at this point uh, finish, and maybe there are questions. And please don't be shy. Ask any question. It does not have to relate to this particular topic. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Mashiavsky, for your very informative presentation. Uh, we did get a few questions that came in. Uh, our first question comes from Lee. She is asking, once a PNH patient is diagnosed with MDS, do they continue Solaris or uh, another treatment for PNH? Um, she's also asking, how is treatment determined? So once more, can you, can you divide it in, com in compartments? Sure. So the first part of the question deals with so the first question is, once a PNH patient is diagnosed with MDS, do they continue Solaris or begin another treatment for PNH? Mm. That's the first question. Well, again, this is a very uh, rare scenario that the patient who, uh, with PNH evolves, if you wish, to myelosplastic syndrome. There would be no preclusion, if this were the case, to continue eculizumab. However, this might be that if myelosplastic features of this disease predominate, they lose a responsiveness to eculizumab because in myelosplastic syndrome, what predominates is usually lack of production rather than destruction. So, but again, and you know, once myelosplastic syndrome evolves, the treatment for patients who might have an option of bone marrow transplantation would be bone marrow transplantation rather than continuing eculizumab. Okay, thank you. Then I believe you kind of answered her second question, which was how is treatment determined? Yeah. Uh, our next question comes from Fred. Fred would like to know, is there a type of MDS that is most associated with PNH? Well, I think what what is important to know is that a lot of a lot of impressions that MDS and PNH coexist is related to inability to make a proper diagnosis. In my practice I have seen multiple patients who came to me not for PNH but for myelosplastic syndrome and upon testing we realize that they have actually PNH. Then when they went back to their home physician, he still claimed, oh yeah, this is PNH MDS. No, PNH can mimic many features of MDS. For instance, PNH has big swollen red cells we call macrocytosis, or myelosplastic syndrome has macrocytosis. You can have anemia in myelosplastic syndrome, you can have anemia in PNH. Bone marrow is hypercellular in PNH, and bone marrow is hypercellular in myelosplastic syndrome. So I think a lot of confusion is to sort out whether a patient indeed has pure PNH, and we don't need mess around with the diagnosis of myelosplastic syndrome, whether a patient has MDS, does not have PNH, or whether they are the rare instances where both diseases are present together. So to me, the issue is... Um, the issue is more whether the proper diagnosis was made. And I I try to uh, sort of, the diagnosis, uh, well, nobody likes to have PNH, but the diagnosis of myelosplastic syndrome is in, to by, consider by many a sort of more serious and, 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 and lethal diagnosis, but uh, 
patients are being labeled just because the proper diagnosis of, of, of PNH has not been made. So, but if we were to say, hey, who are the patients, if they have MDS would develop PNH or vice versa, who are the patients with PNH who develop MDS? Would be, these are the patients who have features similar to hypoplastic MDS, and then they develop PNH, in which case I would question the original diagnosis of, of hypoplastic MDS. Now, have I seen in my praxis patients who had true PNH and then evolved to, yes, I, I, I did, but probably out of 100, 200 patients, I recall maybe three, four cases. So I am always very wary of binding this or re relating the two diagnoses to each other because I think that the, the sum of the, of the fear is given by inability to make a proper diagnosis. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Lynn. Lynn would like to know if a PNH patient is diagnosed with MDS and has a large clone size, does this increase the chance of the patient developing AML? Okay. If the patient with MDS had large clonal size of what? So or or if the patient of, uh, with MDS had large so PNH clone? The question clone. is, if a PNH patient is diagnosed with MDS and has yeah. a large clone size, they didn't uh, mention what, what yeah, percentage, yeah, yeah. Uh, does this increase the chance of the patient developing AML? Well, I mean, this can be tested in the sense that one wants to know whether MDS evolved in PNH, and I show you the slide to that end, that in some patients they have the, the, the PGA mutation which defines PNH is the second event, second hit we call it in genetics, or whether the PGA gene hit mutation was the first hit and MDS evolved within this. But again, and this could be the, the cell if you do mut mutational sequencing beyond PGA gene, and we do it routinely here where I am, and try to determine this, but I would like to see in a patient who has established big PNH clone, really an objective sign that patient now has MDS. And to me, this objective sign would be if patient develop chromosomal abnormality. So I vividly recall patient who is now very well and, and doing well, who had PNH, large clone, but eventually we found trisomy 8, which is a hallmark of myelosplastic syndrome of this type. And while we were treating him with eculizumab and he was doing a sort of okay, the response of eculizumab went down because, I'm sorry for this, response to eculizumab went down because, uh, because if you wish, MDS took over. And based on this, we performed bone marrow transplant, which cures the patient from both myelosplastic syndrome and PNH. Now, this is a happy story. And... But it, I think it can be the size of PNH clone does not necessarily uh, tells you whether there is a greater risk of, P, of evolution to MDS or smaller risk. I think the interaction between the original mutations, PGA mutation and the other, would determine what was the first event and what was the second event. All right. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Mark. Mark's uh, question is related to aplastic anemia, not PNH. Mm -hmm. For a 50-year-old patient who has had two successful treatments with horse ATG and cyclosporine, but who is relapsing again, what therapies are the best options? Well, I mean, there are several approaches to it. And, you know, one of the... One of the advances that we have made in recent years is, of course, introduction of Promacta. And this can be introduced together with concomitant immunosuppression. I think very important 
is to determine whether we indeed deal with a relapse of original aplastic anemia, in which case one could treat himself time with ATG, or whether the patient's disease actually progressed to myelosplastic syndrome, in which case ATG is unlikely to be successful. But as far as treating the cytopenia, Beyond application of immunosuppression, one would add either immunosuppression alone or together with, with, with something like Promacta. Okay, thank you. And this is kind of around the ballpark of, since we're talking about cyclosporine and ATG, um, Zulfikar would like you to revisit ATG and cyclosporine therapy for aplastic anemia and, uh, and its effect on PNH evolution. Well, um, so there is a paper in British Journal of Hematology that we just published, and this is a very short paper, but essentially we looked in patients who had tiny clones, and we followed them for many years, how many of, the, at the beginning, how many, or, how many of these patients actually developed true manifest PNH versus how many have still these tiny PNH clones. And it turns that what was most predictive of further progression was the size of the clone at which they were diagnosed. So if somebody was diagnosed with 10% clone, were more likely to develop PNH than somebody who was diagnosed with 0.3% PNH clone. The other thing that came about among these patients who were treated with cyclosporin versus those who get ATG, patients who got ATG had less likely evolution in comparison to those who were treated only with cyclosporin. So these were two most striking findings. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from Lee. Lee would like to know, do you recommend PNH patients being tested for MDS? If so, how often? There is no really test for PNH and for MDS. Um, I don't recommend this testing. The best is to monitor the counts and see whether a decline of counts, particularly, as, as you know, the hemoglobin may vary. Eculizumab might be metabolized faster and so on. But if patients develop new cytopenia, in other words, new neutropenia, new uh, thrombocytopenia, low platelet count, in addition, patient reticulocytes go down, then it's a possibly sign that there is some change in the disease characteristic, and this would prompt uh, investigation, for example, of the bone marrow cytogenetics or mutational testing. If mutation typical of myelosplastic syndrome would find, this would establish diagnosis. If one would find chromosomal abnormalities, it would establish diagnosis. But the best screen for, oh, yeah, I am developing myelosplastic syndrome would be to look whether my disease changed in character. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Casey. Casey would like to know, is there any association between PRCA and PNH? I have not seen this type of association. So it's, it's usually presence of, if I see somebody who I suspect might have PRCA and I find PNH clone, I rather think that this patient will develop aplastic anemia. Remember, PRCA is not considered a stem cell disease, but the progenitor disease. A progenitor, so if you look at my presentation and you go early on, I, uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to cause seizure anybody, but if you look at this diagram, where you have where you have the stem cells and you have committed progenitor, so this is a precursor of red of erythrocytes. We call these cells progenitors. This is a stem cell. This we call progenitors. Pure cell aplasia is a cell of a disease of progenitors. Aplastic anemia is a disease of stem cells. PNH it's a stem cell disease, so it's associated with aplastic anemia. It's not associated with pure cell aplasia. But you say, well, but I have pure cell aplasia and PNH. Then I ask, are we sure that your disease is pure cell aplasia? Okay? 
All right. Thank you. Uh, I believe we have one more question, and this question comes from Mary. Mary would like to know, is it possible to be diagnosed with all three diseases? And by this, she means aplastic anemia, MDS, and PNH. If so, how common is this? It's very com uncommon. These diseases are commonly associated. So patients who have aplastic anemia and evolve to PNH, this is a classical complication. Patients who have aplastic anemia develop MDS, it's a classical combination. To develop two of them is by far less common, and I have seen it in a couple of instances, but I am always curious whether the association with MDS and PNH is not due to misdiagnosis rather than the true association. So I have seen it where objectively there was myelosplastic syndrome diagnosed by presence of abnormal chromosomes in PNH. But these patients are rare. All right. Uh, I believe those are all the questions that we have at this time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mashiawski, for your wonderful presentation and for your time. Thank you. I hope I this was informative. And if there are other questions, please send them to me per email, and I will try to answer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would also just like to add, if anyone that's still on the webinar, if you would like to rewatch this webinar at a later time, please be on the lookout for an email that will provide you with an archive link within four to seven business days. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today and making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were not able to answer your question today, please send it to us via email at help, that's H-E-L-P, at aamds.org so that our patient educator can respond. Or visit our online academy at aamds.org forward slash learn for interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question. As a reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. We appreciate your time to complete this survey. Again, thank you for joining us, and remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program.